In this episode of Physically Spiritual, I continue my exploration of fatherhood. Welcome to Physically Spiritual. I've been amazed by how much growing physically healthier has changed my spiritual life. I'm captivated by discovering the truth about my body and how it relates to my relationship with God. Physically Spiritual is my attempt to harmonize and share what I've discovered. I'm your host, Andrew Reinhardt. This is a second episode in a series of five so, but this one builds on the previous one. So I'm going to give you a little recap of the previous episode, but if you didn't listen to the previous episode, you might want to go back and listen to that one before this one. In the previous episode, I just started by sharing that this last year I became a father for the first time. And in this series, I wanted to share some of what I've learned, but I'm also going to school in this series. So the next three episodes, guests are going to be on the show who have taught me something about fatherhood and different things that I want to emulate now as I am blessed to be a father. So some of the characteristics I talked about in the last episode. First, a father gives good things to his children, but the best thing a father can give is himself. Second, a father calls forth the heart of their child, but a father calls forth their child's heart by giving them his own heart. And then finally, a father disciplines his children, but discipline's not primarily something you do it's something you are. The discipline of the father's life calls forth discipline in the children's life. And then I ended the previous episode by talking about the relationship between spiritual fatherhood and physical fatherhood, or between natural fatherhood and supernatural fatherhood. All men are called to fatherhood, but only some of those men will have their own biological children or will have the opportunity to adopt a child. But everyone is called to some level of of spiritual fatherhood or spiritual motherhood. We have kind of the, the examples of this, the people who most intensely live that life and our priests and our religious brothers and religious sisters in the church who give their whole life for the building of the kingdom of heaven. They, in a special way, live out fatherhood and motherhood in a way that builds up the whole church, the ecclesial family. But on the other hand, all of the baptized live out their baptismal priesthood. And as baptismal priests, we give our lives to help Christ build up the domestic church, the church as expressed in our home, in our families, in our extended families, and in our relationships. So everyone is called to spiritual fatherhood. Only some will have the opportunity for, for natural fatherhood. But, but fatherhood is, is, is sort of core and essential to, to manhood. And motherhood is core and essential to womanhood, and everyone lives that out differently depending on their life. So for this episode, I wanted to start with the idea that, that God reveals himself to us as father. Like nothing is more physically spiritual than parenthood. God reveals himself to us in this relationship. In the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, Philip asked Jesus this question, Master, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you for so long a time, and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father and whatever you ask in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. God reveals himself to us as Father and, and he originally did this as, as creator and he was father of this people, Israel. But in the new covenant, he reveals himself as father in an even more intense way. He reveals himself as father of the son in the divine trinity, co-eternal, right? Father and sonhood are, are simultaneous. So, so even though the father is the source of the child, the father is not a father until he has a child. So fatherhood and sonship are simultaneous. And therefore, uh, the, the, co-equality and co-eternity of father and son aren't contradicted by those titles. So, so God reveals himself as father, as the father of Jesus. And then we as Christians 
are called to be another Christ. We take on that name because it's a reality. Baptism, the, the sacramental image of baptism, one of the effects of it is, is divinization, that we become like God. So we're called to become another Christ as Christians. So in an even more intense way than as creator or as father of a people, God is also our father. And our faith expresses this by the language of adoption, that we're adopted into God's family. And, and we're even, in a sense, more God's children now in the order of grace. So all fatherhood on earth is a participation in God's fatherhood. All fatherhood on earth is a participation in God's fatherhood. God is, in a sense, sort of the exemplar of fatherhood, the, the model of fatherhood, the image of fatherhood. And, and all fatherhood that we on earth have is something that God gives us in authority and in a responsibility that's delegated to us. And then we, we, we attempt to be like God to those we're called to father, to our children, natural or supernaturally. Notice in Philip's question, he says, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus doesn't say that you need more than to see the Father. Jesus doesn't say that that won't be enough for him. What Jesus says is that you, he already has experienced the Father through him. So what that implies is that showing us the Father is enough for us. That showing us the Father is enough for us. It corresponds to the deepest longing of the human heart. It corresponds to our deepest needs, our deepest longings. This is what John Eldridge has to say in his book, Fathered by God. He says, you are the son, and you could think daughter too. So you are the son or daughter of a kind, strong, and engaged father. A father who is wise enough to guide you in the way generous enough to provide you for the journey, offering to walk with you every step. This is perhaps the hardest thing for us to believe, really believe deep down in our hearts, so that it changes us forever, changes the way we approach each day. So we, we have this God who, who shows himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who literally dies for us experiencing the, the worst torture possible, right? Jesus is just, or God is just screaming, I love you in the crucifixion. In, in the most powerful way, just screaming into the human heart, I love you, trust me. I, I do care for you. I want good things for you. The serpent was lying to you. I love you. But even with this, it's, it's hard for us to believe that it could be that good that God loves us that much, that he would have done that for us if we were the only person that needed saving. But that's the deepest longing of our heart for that kind of love, for that engagement with the Father, for that guidance from a good Father to be provided for in the journey. And not just provided these things. Remember, the best thing the Father can give is himself. So God doesn't give us in exchange of spiritual currency, grace isn't currency. It isn't an object that God creates and then distributes to us and then we hold on to it and use it. Right? What God gives us is himself, his own divine life. So, so God giving us grace is God giving us his own life. It's not an impersonal thing that's given, an object. It's the divine life as manifested in our life. So God gives himself to us. He, he's not far from us. So what Philip is saying here, it will be enough for us, meaning that we get something from God and then we don't need him anymore. This enough for us means that being in a relational state of communion with God is what satisfies us. Another thing in this reading is this echo, where there's an echo of the Father in his Son. We, we experience God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ. In his words and his actions, a father is experienced in his son. I know, and as my wife and I have been married now for almost a decade, um, there's different things I do. And she says, you sound just like your dad, or you're doing something just like your dad, or even the way I sit sometimes is like my parents, right? There's this way that my parents' life, their, their lessons they gave me, the words they used, the, the ways they acted, 
echo in my life. So there's a real sense that, that my father is present to people through me. Now, some of us hear that and they're like, oh, goodness gracious, not, <laughs> not my father. Others of us are like, like, yeah, like I hope so. I hope even more so as I grow into my manhood. Um, but but our, our, our fathers and our mothers echo in our lives. And this was the case for Jesus. You know, so when we encounter Jesus in the scripture, when we encounter Jesus in our prayer, we're ex- encountering also God the Father. Like there's no one, no persons are closer than the persons of the Trinity. <laughs> they're so close, they're one, right? That's the mystery of the thing. So we experience the Father by experiencing the Son. And in God's design in our families and in the ways we're called to spiritual parenthood or supernatural parenthood in, in the church, uh, people will experience God in and through us. I talked about last time how the first catechism for the children are the bodies of their parents. right? Our, our, the, the love we share, our, our touches, the, the, the breastfeeding we provide, the the, the feeding the child with, with food from a bottle, the, the, the different ways that we, we provide for our children with our bodies teaches them a lesson. It teaches them something that then resonates with the truth they hear in the gospel as they get older and being cap- capable of learning that way. So, so in our lives, the fatherhood of God and the motherhood of God echo in our actions in such a way that, that preaches the gospel. The same way that Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection scream to the world, I love you, trust me, we're called to live lives that scream to the world, I love you, God loves you, trust me. All right, I want to finish this introductory series by talking a little bit about what's sometimes called the fatherhood gap, right? Every father is called to imitate God the Father, but all earthly fathers fall short simply saying no one's perfect. Like like recognizing the fact that your parents weren't perfect is just simply recognizing the fact that your parents weren't God. And that's just a plain fact of reality. Uh, So so the the idea of this isn't to like parent blame or to say, you know, it's just my my parents' fault that my life is all messed up or anything like that. No, it's a recognition that, that they weren't perfect. And as a result of that, I need more than them. Meaning I need a community around me. I need the church. And I also need God. My earthly father doesn't replace my need fully for my heavenly father, even though at best what my earthly father gives me is what my heavenly father has given him. This is how the catechism states it. Catechism 239 says, By calling God father, the language of faith indicates two main things, that God is the first origin of everything and transcendent authority, and that he is at the same time goodness and loving care for all of his children. God's paternal tenderness can also be expressed in the image of motherhood, which emphasizes God's imminence, the intimacy between creator and creature. The language of faith thus draws on the human experience of parents, who are, in a way, the first representatives of God for man. But this experience also tells us that human parents are fallible, and can disfigure the face of fatherhood and motherhood. All right, so the catechism is recognizing this reality that when, when we fall short in, in natural fatherhood and motherhood or supernatural fatherhood and motherhood, we create an anti-gospel. We're preaching truths that will make it more difficult for people to believe God's word. We, we disfigure the face of motherhood and fatherhood for those that experience our brokenness. But this isn't a reason to despair, right? This is a reason to be inspired to conversion for that, that journey of, of ongoing, going further up and further in, into the life of God, right? To, to repent, pick up your cross, and follow me as Jesus exhorts us. So we, we just simply repent, pick up the life of Christ, and go deeper in. The idea isn't to wallow in our, in our limitedness. We shouldn't be surprised by our imperfection. It's just simply the reality. This is what our Lord says in Psalm 68. He says that he's father of the fatherless and defender of widows. God in his holy abode, God gives a home to the forsaken. So God is father of the fatherless, defender of widows. He gives a home to the forsaken. 
And I think what God is expressing here is in a particular way, in the details of our life, the ways that fatherhood and motherhood has been disfigured by our difficult experiences in our past, that it's in God's providence that, that he will provide for that to be made right, right? That he will heal our heart in those places, that, that he will untwist those knots, that he will bring us to a place of wholeness and healing. Uh, this idea of being father to the fatherless, right? Some people, they don't have fathers, right? They're, they're orphans or their father dies or their father leaves or all these terrible things that happen. And, and in hearing this, this teaching, these episodes might be difficult. And I want to honor that and respect that, that there's probably very few wounds that you can have that are more deep and grievous than that. But this also then draws on the beauty of the life of the church, right? Because this father gap can be filled in by, by the life of good holy priests, by people in the community, sports coaches, aunts and uncles, uh, even sometimes older siblings step up and, and fill this gap for people. So it's, it's really the, the beauty of, of the community, of the church that comes into these places and heals. So when God heals us, this isn't just like a mystical experience where God comes to us as Father in our prayer. Yes, he does that. But God also has people he's bringing into our life to incarnate his fatherhood for us, right? to give us an experience in our bodies of his fatherhood and motherhood. And in, in this process, this healing process, it, it's really, it's in a real way, therapeutic. Right? God is, is reconfiguring the face of motherhood and fatherhood for us so that, that we can give that love to others, that we can live that out in our natural or supernatural fatherhood or motherhood that we're called to. But, but that, that healing process also helps us to become more in his likeness, more, uh, more living out that divinizing call that we have in our baptism, more disposed to the grace that God is offering us. So, so this experience of, of healing in these difficult places, I believe is really core to our spiritual life core to our, our supernatural pursuit of God's gifts and God's graces. So I want to end this episode with a prayer. This is also from John Eldridge and Fathered by God. He says, Father, what did I miss here in this stage? Did I know I was a beloved son? Do I believe it even now? Come to me in this place over these years speak to me do i believe you want good things for me is my heart secure in your love how was my young heart wounded in my life as a boy and jesus you who came to heal the broken heart come to me here heal this stage in my heart Restore me as the beloved son. Father me. In, in John Eldridge's model, he was, we, we pass through these different stages of development or maturing, you know, going from being a, a son to going on adventure, to being a, a warrior, to being, becoming a lover and becoming a, a father, then becoming an elder. And so we, we kind of pass through these different stages of development. And when, when key things are missing in an earlier stage, right, the, the nurturing we needed or being protected from trauma or something like that, what happens is we can get kind of stuck there. There can be a place in our life that remains little and small and, and wounded. And this father really, this prayer really brings us out. Father, what did I miss here in this stage? Right, what did I miss when I was very little? when I was completely dependent on my parents? What did I miss as I got older? As, as I was learning to love my wife, what did I miss here? And he, he calls out with this beautiful prayer. Jesus, you who came to heal the broken heart, come to me here, heal this stage in my heart, restore me as the beloved son and father me. Thank you so much for being a part of Physically Spiritual. Every moment of the show you've watched, know that I'm grateful that you've given your time to this. I'm so passionate about the message that I'm trying to share, and I'm excited about the future of the show. 
So thank you for every like, every view, every watch, every follow, every comment, every rating you give in the show. And a special thank you to all you that are already members of the Awakened Nation. So thanks again for supporting the show.